am so excited uh, for us to have this conversation. Uh, we are joined uh, this afternoon, uh, at least it's this afternoon we're recording, or this afternoon for me, it's morning for Mandy. Uh, Mandy Smith is a pastor from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, she's written a couple of wonderful books, The Vulnerable Pastor and Unfettered. Um, I I've probably shared how meaningful Unfettered has been for me like a million times. So Mandy, thank you for all of the work that went into your sharing that story and that message with us. And thanks for joining us this morning to help us kick off our experiment in surrendering control. Mm, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, great. Well, let's, let's jump in. Unfettered. Uh, the book is really about having a childlike faith. And the theme of the book, as I really experienced it reading it, was that it's about having a properly ordered relationship with control. You said uh, to be childlike is to be unafraid of being powerless. And mm. so I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about how this book came into being? Yeah, I was actually on a sabbatical, you know, pastors sometimes get this eight weeks and they don't know what to do with themselves. And <laughs> at the beginning, I just said to the Lord, what am I, what am I going to do? My husband was still working. My kids were still in school and it was just me. And I just felt this prompt of like, I get to just be like a kid, you know, I get to do, I get to eat what I feel like eating and sleep if I feel like sleeping and cry or dance or you know, whatever, jump in puddles. If I feel like jumping in puddles, no one's expecting anything of me. And that felt like a really great, so that was kind of an experiment that was like, mm, wow, mm -hmm. how do I, do I even remember, remember those little prompts that I had as a child? And I promised myself at the beginning, anytime that I feel that kind of prompt of like, I need to touch that leaf. Is it really as soft as it looks? Or, you know, I need to jump in that puddle or I, whatever. I'm going to take my shoes off and walk in that stream or whatever. Um, I just said in the beginning, I'm just going to say yes to it. As long as it's not illegal or immoral, why not? That's my promise. This is my ex my experiment for the next eight weeks. And then I'll go back to being an adult. And it was surprising for me how much pushback there was when mm. I was just trying to do that. So one day in particular at the beginning, um, I felt a prompt. I was walking along a long fence and I just felt this prompt of like, I really need to drag a stick along this fence. <laughs> and um so I marched and I was like, well, that's ridiculous. That's just silly. What a waste of time. There's other adults around. They're going to think I'm dumb. And I was like, nope, I promised I'd do this. So I marched my, like, then it becomes like, I'm determined now. It's like an act of will. So I marched um, myself back to the beginning of this long fence and took ages, couldn't find a stick anywhere. So by this time I'm like, I don't even want to do it anymore. <laughs> and um, I like, I forced myself. I was like, I'm going to drag this stick along this fence if it kills me. And other adults were walking past and I was like, they're going to think I'm so stupid. But it actually made me see there's there's all this false self stuff in us when we become mm -hmm. adults mm -hmm. that is like all worried about control and how other people see us. And if we're going to like protecting ourselves from disappointment. And mm -hmm. so when I got back to work, something had awoken in me and I couldn't put it away and I couldn't tell anymore if it was my childlike instinct or the spirit in me. And when I got back to work, it started prompting me to do kind of scary things like pray for healing for somebody and ask the whole congregation to do it with me, which we'd never done before. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, man, this is, this is serious. And I started realizing it was, it was so much more than just whimsy, although it includes that it was yeah. about being, being open to the spirit and getting over some kind of baggage of, of Western power. Yeah. Mandy, I, I am so sorry. I'm, we're going to have to edit this out. My wife, my wife is called, she's called twice oh, God. now. Yeah, you so should pay attention give, to that. Yeah, give me one second. I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Okay, Mandy, I'm back. <laughs> Did you see the kookaburra? No, oh no, I didn't. Can you see him? Yes. Yeah. 
Oh man. He doesn't come very often. Oh, he that's so amazing. cool. Oh, yeah, I love kookaburras. They're like the oh. they're like little monastic birds because they're really quiet most of the time and quite solitary. And then when they get together, they like they mostly only make that laughter noise when they're with a bunch of other kookaburras, which I love. Okay. Oh man. So he's well, he's my favorite. The wildlife of Australia is like yes. the greatest. You can't yeah. You can't live without being interrupted by things all the time. Birds, especially. Oh, so. <laughs> I, I love it. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. My wife. No, is she okay? She's fine. She, she forgot what day the interview was. And so she was like, she's like, wait, I didn't, I didn't remember who was picking up who. <laughs> and I was like, I'm oh, no. Right now. <laughs> so it's she, all good. Yeah, it's, doesn't bother yeah, me. It's totally, it's totally fine. So, um, but now I've got it like, that was a, that was a good way that you wrapped it up, and now I'm gonna feel like it's it's just gonna end up being like a hard sort you of. You should you just need to start by saying, "Wow, amazing point there, Mandy," or something like that. <laughs> wow, Mandy, that saying, was. I was uh, saying, oh, about um, when I got back to work, I couldn't tell anymore the difference between the childlike mm-hmm. instincts in me and the spirit at work in me, and I realized there was baggage from Western ways of doing yeah. power. Yeah, well, and, and you were saying there too about the way as adults, the way that we sort of, we begin to protect ourselves, obviously there's, there are really important boundaries to set and things like that. So we're not talking about, you know, something that's, that's actually dangerous, but the sort of self-protective instincts, the, the desire to um, protect how people see us, like those are really another form of control. Oh, absolutely. It's huge. And there's a reason why people say they're more afraid of public speaking than of death, because, Mm. um, you know, self-preservation is pretty strong and caring about what other people think is pretty strong. But Jesus actually calls us constantly to do really uncomfortable things. Um, And I've actually been watching, you know, there's the Asbury revival going on at the moment that everybody's talking about. And I understand there's reasons to have hesitations about that. And we have a lot of baggage with ways revival has been abused, but I do wonder if our own skepticism is protecting, you know, trying to protect us Mm. from looking foolish and being disappointed. And if that actually keeps us from being present to when the spirit does do things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a, there's a danger in that kind of, that kind of self-protection that, I mean, it, it keeps us from being open. I mean, you, you talk about that in the book. I mean, but that, that keeping our, preventing ourselves from being open, protecting ourselves from being open to the possibility of, I mean, to be honest, like to be made a fool of in some cases, like that, that can keep us from encountering God's presence with yep. us in the midst yep. of our everyday lives. Right. And I think we often say like, come Holy Spirit. We don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit. And I actually don't think it's the best theology to say, come Holy Spirit, although it's Mm -hmm. nice for us to remember again that we want it and we're choosing it. Uh I think the Holy Spirit is already here. Like we've already been promised. We're filled with the Spirit. And the question is if we're just, I I think it's like cramped in the corner Yeah. and it's like, I'm here already. Will you get some of this other junk out of here so I can do my thing? Yeah. Um, And so we, we keep, we keep trying even harder because we don't see the outcomes that we're looking for. And I think yeah. in some ways trying a little less hard is the way to actually uh, step into the possibility that God's already working. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's tough for us too, because of the culture that we live in, right? Like our, yeah. our culture, like our culture really insists that control is a virtue, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we talk about, we talk about, like being out of control is a bad thing, you know, get a, get control of yourself. We say like, we, we expect that we should have control. Why, why do you think our culture is so infatuated with Mm -hmm. power and control? Well, it feels good. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have a lot more at our disposal now than people used to have. And so we can, we have, it's an illusion of control actually, you know, because as we saw with COVID Mm -hmm. some one little virus undoes Mm -hmm. everything that we think we're in control of. If we suddenly lost power or the internet, like suddenly we realize we, we don't really have that much control and um, people throughout history and people in other parts of the world who don't have the kind of technology and medicine and advantages, privileges that we have, Actually, I think are more comfortable. They're more at peace with the fact that they that they 
aren't in control of everything and there's more there's more openness to the ways that god is is working i think so yeah yeah it's very it's actually very tricky for us to work in a place where i can pick up my phone at any moment and find answers to almost every question yeah um and to still say but actually god is the ultimate one who knows all things you know it's it's yeah it's a challenge yeah yeah it's interesting i mean that what you just named that that the control that we feel is actually an illusion Mm -hmm. but but we want that illusion right like we're willing to fight for that illusion (laughs) yeah Yeah. and then it lets us down until it lets us down yeah and that's you know i think that's so interesting what we've what we can see in our culture in our world after covid where where like you said that that illusion of control was shattered by this this tiny little virus and all of a sudden we realize oh, we don't have the kind of control that we thought we did like right. how how have you seen the pandemic impact our relationships with control Yeah, I think people for whom that was the first experience actually thought like we just got to scramble harder. Like in the past, we've been able to be in control because we've thrown some money at it or we've thrown some more Mm. work at it or whatever. And that's worked in the past. So we just got to do that again. And so there's this like desperate effort to just regain the control. And people, and honestly, I think oftentimes people on the margins um, who, who haven't really had that much control. They were like, you know what? It's not the first time we felt this way. And they have more of a capacity for, for that feeling of like, we're going to do the best we can in this situation that's out of our hands. And we're going to trust that God is not surprised by this. Um, and I, it actually reminds me oftentimes of, I always had this image in my head of choices that we make where we're kind of like, treading water desperately at the top of a waterfall Mm. and you know trying to overcome this this current that's trying to sweep us over the edge and it's exhausting but we just want to try to keep it up because we're terrified of the like you know to get tumbled around and thrown down a waterfall is a terrifying thing we don't know if we're going to survive it but maybe there's this like calm new space at the bottom Mm. that we won't be living in this desperate treading water constantly and but it may mean having to stop treading water for a bit you know and like going through the crisis and somehow re-emerging in a place where you're like you know what I grew in my capacity for things I couldn't control and uh, found God in a new way and now I can coast (laughs) in the craziness the craziness doesn't go away but you have a different approach to it yeah that's I want to I want to stay, this is one of the things I appreciate about you so much is the the images that you, that you share. Mm -hmm. And that, that image is so profound. The idea of treading water at the top of a waterfall, because, you know, a river before a waterfall is usually really, really tumultuous. And, and we have the sense that we can have the sense of control because we are treading water in this incredibly, you know, tumultuous waters churning and rapids and and yet if we're willing to brave the the risk the scariness of surrendering there is the opportunity for calm waters i imagine that you know pool at the bottom mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. of the waterfall for us to really to just immerse ourselves and soak in the beauty and in the peace of Christ, but we have to be willing. It's it's almost like a detox that we have to go through. Yeah, it gets worse before it gets better. Like it makes sense. Human survival instinct is strong. And there's a reason why you'd rather have treading water at the top of a waterfall than going down the waterfall. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. But it's death, it's life, death and resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. Jesus Mm -hmm. didn't say, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a better version of where you are. Uh, or, you know, I'll bring you back to where you already are. He says like, you got to go through this death first and you come out to a totally new place. And so, um, I think that theme runs through so many of the really transformative moments of our lives, but we don't want to move into the death, trusting that there's a new, totally new way of seeing on the other side. Yeah. And I think, you know, death to our control, we don't, we won't embrace, we won't be available to the things that, um, that he has to offer us until we, till we let go of that control. But it's so hard because you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's really what is at stake in our grasping and clinging to control, right? Is the, right. like the loss of that kind of life, a life in freedom and peace and, and swimming in the waters that really, I mean, you referenced uh, true self and false self earlier, it, swimming in the waters that we were designed by our creator to swim in. Right. Yeah. And, and just so you know, like I've actually, like, I'm an A-type kind of personality. I get a lot of stuff done. I um I always got straight A's. Like I'm a very, uh, it's not like I'm this super chill, easygoing person. <laughs> but honestly, I march myself over a cliff. I think I tell this story in The Vulnerable Pastor that um, my willpower is stronger than my body and my mind. And mm. I, I walked myself right into depression because, um, because I just was, not willing to embrace this fact that God has put me in this little body that gets tired and runs out of mm-hmm. ideas and needs a rest and gets sick and gets old. And um, so really, I mean, it's confronting, it's just confronting reality that we're talking about here, you know, that yeah. that we're trying to be something that we're not and it's never going to work because it's not true. Yeah. So the sooner we can actually be honest with and live according to how we were created to be the more the happier we're going to become yeah and when it when it comes when control comes into play in that journey and we're we come face to face with the reality that we're grasping after something that the idea of not having control can be really scary that's how, terrifying yeah yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> i don't want like, to minimize that in any way it feels yeah. like that yeah, yeah, and I I think that's really important, <laughs> right? Because I think that oftentimes in churches we talk about stuff like this, and it's like, well, yeah, you just have to surrender control, and we don't acknowledge yeah. the reality of it. And I think, like, I that that feels like I I don't think it's too strong of a of a thing to say that that feels like pastoral malpractice, right? Yeah. To, to just tell someone just just yeah just just let go and mm-hmm. and to not acknowledge that this is hard and yeah. this is scary and like for most of us, because we live in this culture where we're told that control is something that you're entitled to, that you should have, when we come face to face with situations where that illusion of control is shattered. And if, if we're honest, like COVID is a really big one, but the reality is we come face to face with those every mm, single every day, day, right? Yep. I mean, just, yep. I mean, something like, you know, a car accident or a health scare, or, I mean, we can, I mean, there's a, a number of different things that we can come up with that, that shatter that illusion of control. Yeah. In your experience, I mean, personally, as a pastor, obviously I'm not asking you to share anything that, A, you're not comfortable with and isn't a story for you to share, but how have you seen people, like, how do you think people typically respond when they come face to face with that illusion of control being shattered and they experience the, the, the frightening reality of that? Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just that startle kind of reflex, isn't it? It reminds me of when a baby's first born and it's used to having the womb around them and then suddenly they're out in open space and their arms just kind of, you know, like flipping yeah, and reaching yeah. like where are the walls here where are my boundaries here you know and um it reminds me of that of like where i'm falling i'm i'm just lost you know and um that can be a moment of real crisis of like i said before just trying to get back to the place that felt safe or it can be a real moment of of insight a real moment of salvation hmm, mm-hmm. so i think it's a really sacred moment and i've I've been with people in that moment where, um, yeah, a couple of moments are coming to mind. And I've been in those moments myself where everything in our culture has told us, this is, this is your fault. Like Mm -hmm. you, you've lost control because you're not smart enough. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't throw enough money at it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with you because look, everybody else seems to be fine. Look at all the ads, all the media, like everyone else is managing somehow. And, um, and so when I've kind of come to that place in my own life, there's this deep shame that I think the enemy brings to us of saying something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm, And it's mm -hmm. taken me some time to say something is wrong with the world that tells us something's wrong with us for just being human beings. Yeah. 
And so it's kind of made me mad now where I'm like, no, <laughs> something is something is wrong with the world that tells human beings they have to be perfect and that they can never make mistakes. And that, you know, it's it's actually really bad theology because the Bible says in our weakness, God is strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more that we fill up ourselves and try to be enough, the less people see the miracle of God showing his glory through ordinary human life. Yeah. So, um yeah, there's but there's there's so much shame. And this is one of the reasons why I talk about this kind of stuff is because I needed somebody else to say, you know what? It's not you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. You're not alone. We're all feeling it. Some of us are just better at hiding it than others. Yeah. Or maybe have more resources than others to be able to throw away the problem. Yeah. But um yeah, it's terrifying to to share these stories, but I do it because um, because I, I just want to speak against the darkness that accuses us and tells us we just have to keep working harder. And this is why we have people committing suicide and people depressed and anxious and families breaking up. And, you know, I'm really glad that people are talking more about mental health issues because, yeah. um, because something isn't right with the expectations that we have. Yeah. 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 And you in, in unfettered, you, you talk about like the like that we have a tendency either to resort to deflated inactivity or puffed up overactivity that when we like so i may forgive me i might be reading into some of what you what you have been saying and and what you wrote but but when we do come face to face with that illusion that, that our idea of control is an illusion and we encounter that shame that it's somehow our fault we we have this tendency to either resort to inactivity or mm -hmm. overactivity. We either grasp even harder for control, we work even harder, or we we check out, we um, you know, we avoid, we distract ourselves. Yep. I'm trying to remember there were some words that came to me when I was writing that. And I can't remember if I put them in the book or not, because they're a bit cheesy because they rhyme. And I didn't mean to make them rhyme. <laughs> but it's like we try to overcome it. Mm -hmm. We try to numb it. Hmm. or we succumb to it hmm. so um we either get totally overwhelmed by it we just like try to ignore it or we think it's our job to to dominate it and none of those things actually really help and yeah. so i think this is actually a moment of salvation like i think this is not this is not how i had the gospel communicated to me it was usually more about you know hmm. sin and the cross-shaped bridge and all that kind of stuff which is meaningful yeah for many people and feeling guilty. I never felt guilty, but I've always, mm -hmm. well, I do feel guilty, but you know, my main motivation towards Jesus wasn't about, I feel so far from God. My main motivation towards Jesus was I feel so inadequate. I feel so weak and small mm -hmm. and I've got nothing to offer. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it was a shame, not a, it was more shame than guilt. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so for me, this is not just like buck up, Jesus can use you type stuff. Like you can be good at your job, even if you don't feel good at your job or something like that. Although that is part of it. Most of it for me is um, this is, this is a moment of salvation when we constantly on our, on a daily basis feel um, honestly, it's like the accusations that Jesus experienced in the, in the garden, in the wilderness Yeah, that I believe Satan was tempting Jesus to be ashamed of his fundamental humanity. Hmm. And to say, yeah, you know what? I could just go back to being God anytime, give up on the human part of my nature yeah. because he's, he's asking mm -hmm. him to just shortcut some basic human things of needing to eat mm -hmm. and not being able to control how people respond to you and being spectacular. And, um, and I just, I think Jesus was more willing to be human than we are. Hmm. But wow. I think I'm <laughs> learning more about what it means to be human from Jesus. Like I'm realizing he's such a good model of that because he was like, no, nah, I refuse to be ashamed of what's ordinary about me and what's limited about me so that I can actually be among my people. And so that they, Hebrews talks about this. He became glorious. He became ordinary like us so that we could see how we're glorious like him. Yeah. And and so in this, it's not just a lowering and a like, I'm so small and I'm so measly and miserable. It's a, wow, look, look where we are as human beings, just the way God made us. Um, you know, they didn't know they were naked in the garden until they sinned. And God was not ashamed of their nakedness until they, you know, they became ashamed of their nakedness. Yeah. Um, and God 
in some strange way says, yes, I see all the ways that you feel so small and broken. And I see opportunity for my glory to be revealed through that. Yeah. Um, but if we're always trying to hide it and, and avoid it, then how can we see the potential for that and let him do that work in us and through us? Yeah. So, so yeah, I think I, I came to this place in unfettered of, of saying, cause the point is not to do nothing. You know, the mm-hmm. point is not to just be like, I'm just going to chill at the pool and let God run the world. Um, and I, and I see this in myself and other people too, that we're always just flipping from it's all up to God. That sounds really spiritual. So I'm just mm-hmm. going to step out and he's, he's good to go, you know? And yeah. then we think, yeah, but he's still, he still asks us to do something in the world. The Bible is filled with yeah. both. It's all up to God and come and do something too. And so then we flip to, okay, well, if I'm engaged, I'm going to engage with my whole self and I'm going to take over this thing and it's all up to me now. And neither of those feels very hopeful. Neither of those requires much engagement with God yeah. because either he's doing everything or we're doing everything. Mm -hmm. And -hmm. what I see in scripture is actually an invitation into partnership that he's the one on mission in the world. And he's like, I really want you to be in this with me because you'll get to see the miracles and when it gets hard, you'll need me even more. And there's even more opportunity for us, for you to grow in me and see how much I love you, even when it's really painful. So that feels better for me, but, and more scriptural, but also really tricky to navigate how to do partnership yeah. with God. Who's that? Who's the one who initiates and asks us to join. Yeah. Um. So that's where, you know, I, I came up with this rest, receive, respond, because I think um, our habits, our education, our, culture everything tells us respond 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 there's a problem respond there's a question respond quick fix it now it's up to you and that runs really deep in all of us um but what i see in all of scripture is yes you have you have a response but it's not the first thing that you do you're called to rest first Mm -hmm. and that i I use rest in the sense of like stepping out from like putting yourself in neutral for us maybe for a second maybe for a day maybe for a year i don't know but even in a meeting, you know, when everything seems to be hitting the fan, every single time that we have stopped to say, okay, we just need to pray, or we just need a moment of silence, or somebody sing a worship song or something, somebody read a passage of scripture. You know, you've been in those meetings where we've just been in kind of reptile mind of yeah. just surviving. Yeah. And suddenly the mammal mind comes back again that's playful and creative and mm-hmm. relational nurturing and something new is possible like we may not from that space get all the answers we need but it may just be it's not all up to you or you've got time um and so i instead of respond 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 which is actually a pretty atheist kind of approach like if god doesn't exist that makes sense yeah but if we claim that there's a god who's already at work in the world then then our call is to rest in him especially in moments of crisis yeah. rest in him and we always if we open ourselves up if we set aside that control we always receive something from him there's always the spirit is always there and it's like finally you've given <laughs> me a bit more space i've got something to give you here and it may just be comfort it may just be encouragement it may be guidance it may be whatever yeah. um, but we won't receive it until we set aside that control and from that then we know how to respond then we know like then we need to engage our gifts and our skills and our resources and throw them all at that but we're doing it in partnership with god now because we've received something from him and he's asking us to to join him in it instead of we're trying to drum something up in our own strength and honestly that's where anything that's fruitful and flourishing in my life comes from Mm -hmm. that approach as as hard as it is to set aside my really deeply ingrained personal habits and cultural instincts to just fix everything in my own strength um it just ends up you know wearing me down and and bringing about the kinds of answers that come from anxiety whereas rest receive respond which is my just my it's my personal philosophy of faith and it's my ministry philosophy as well yeah um if there's any fruitfulness coming from me it comes from that place yeah i think that's a that's a I want to, I'm just going to kind of reiterate what you just said, not because, not because you didn't say it beautifully there, but I just want to make sure everyone kind of catches it that as much as we're talking about surrendering control in this, in this uh, experiment, the reality is there is, there is a space where control, control is right and appropriate and, and determining where that 
line is. When are we grasping for control and trying to take and make things happen? Or when are we having a, a properly ordered relationship with control? Um, one of the ways that we can do that is exactly what you just said, that idea of rest, receive, and respond. That can help us slow down, step outside, put the, put it in neutral, step outside of the that chaos and even some of that fear, the anxiety, the worry, um, the anger that we might experience in the midst of or in the face of that the illusion of control being shattered allows us to respond well with God in partnership. Did I, did I, did I sum that up well? Yeah, Andy? absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's so simple for me to remember. It's just a matter of the order of things. So mm. the response part is still there. I still need to engage, Yeah. but is that the first thing that I do? Yeah. And I think, so if it's hard sometimes to figure out, am I doing too much control? Am I not, con you know, am I not embracing my agency enough? Um, I think what helps me is just to be like, have I rested in the Lord yet? <laughs> and mm. oftentimes I haven't. And if I, if I do, it's a way, you know, when Jesus says, consider the birds and consider the lilies, that sounds like so cheesy Hallmark card, you know, like <laughs> look at the birds, you know, think about the flowers, but he's saying there is a real, and this is why I go for a walk every single morning. And I literally consider the birds. Like I sit and I watch them and I think that bird right there, does not care about the budget that I'm steering over this morning. Not to say the budget is not important, mm -hmm. but there is a kingdom already flourishing in the world that is doing just fine. Yeah. And for me to, to tap into that and to say, I'm also a part of that kingdom. And it brings me back to the important, you know, the pressing things that feel that feel like they are the most important things. It brings me back to that budget with a different kind of energy saying, okay, the God of all creation is, he cares about this more than I do. Yeah. And he's the one who provides things and I can't see how this is going to work out. And it feels like the church is going to close today, but mm. there is a kingdom. God has told me there is a kingdom at work. There is yeast in the dough that we can't see, mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's in everything. And it's, it's bringing life. You know, that little yeast is like doing its thing. And I'm going to make a choice based on the possibility that's true, even though I have no idea what that is right now. Yeah. Wow. It's scary. It's really scary. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do have to ask, is the kookaburra still out there on the fence? I think he flew away. Oh man. So yeah, right but before... you, have, you have a video of him. I think when you were, when you had to cut earlier, I turned the, that's, that's right. Well, uh, I turned well, the camera. We'll edit that back in here, a shot of the, the kookaburra. Yeah, and I just need to say, you did such a good job with Brisbane. A lot of Americans say Brisbane, but you said oh. Brisbane. And that's oh. really good. Oh, and good, I, now, thanks. But now I need to tell you, <laughs> oh, no. it's not, it's kookaburra. Oh, say it, like, wait, say it. Cook, like a cook, cook in the kitchen. Kookaburra? Kookaburra. Kookaburra. Yeah, so not kook, it's not like kooky. Okay, okay. It's cook. Okay, that's Can good. Can you hear the difference in me? I, oh, oh, yeah, one hundred percent. I get, yeah. <laughs> oh so my goodness! I feel, Great. I feel like I need to um, make sure my American friends have like benefit from having an Australian friend. I appreciate that, and I and I also appreciate that you um, that you softened the blow of correcting my <laughs> my pronunciation of kookaburra to help me to, to acknowledge that I pronounced Brisbane properly. Yes, you did. It was very good. I was impressed uh, by that. Well, Mandy, I, I just want to, I just want to ask one last question. I think just one okay. last question. And, and I think we've already given some examples of this, but, but I want to ask like, just really sort of intentionally, can you paint a picture for us of what life can be like if we have this sort of Christ-like relationship with power and control? Mm. The best, do you mean, well, images always come to mind for me. So yeah. let me give a quick scriptural kind of metaphor that helps me and then tell you what that looks like for me. The image from 2 Corinthians 4 is really beautiful to me because it describes the unfading treasure of, of God's glory being housed mm. in clay vessels. Mm -hmm. And it actually says 
you know, Moses got to be in God's presence. And we all are so jealous of Moses because he came down from the mountain with his face glowing. But then it says that faded. Mm -hmm. He didn't get to keep that. On the other hand, we've got something better than Moses. We have the glory of God promised to us that just walks around in our bodies all the time. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we feel how ordinary and broken and limited we are. We're like clay, a clay jar. So imagine a clay jar that's filled with something gorgeous and beautiful. And I actually imagine like molten gold mm -hmm. that fills this mm -hmm. clay vessel and, you know, it seals up the cracks. Mm -hmm. And um, this beautiful thing, we feel the tension of, of this, of the being ordinary, limited, broken, frail vessels that house like the same glory that spoke all creation into existence. This is what Second Corinthians 4 says. Yeah. And so it makes sense if we feel this weirdness about that, but it's also a wonderful opportunity to imagine. So for me, I try so hard. Actually, I'll tell you this. Last night, I couldn't sleep midnight I'd already slept for a couple of hours and then I was wide awake at midnight and um there are just a lot of things on my plate that are just so they're just so far beyond my capacity I can't even I can't even say so I've been awake in the middle of the night every night for the past month or so and I hate that feeling yeah. like I want to be able to fix things and I want to feel good about my work and I want to feel successful. And I'm a really smart person. Like I'm a really hardworking person. <laughs> I read a bunch. I've studied. I have a lot of friends that I reach out to as resources and it's still never enough. Like this is not, this is not opting out and just mm. using saying like, I'm just small and weak, so I don't have to do anything. This is trying everything you've got and still finding it's not enough. Yeah. And so in the middle of the night last night, um, I was feeling that and I was uh, in hindsight, I'm really happy that 15 years ago, this took me to a really dark place. Every time I felt this way, where I was like, God, I'm so ashamed of myself that I can't be enough for you. Mm. You've made a mistake because I can't do this thing you've asked me to do. And uh, just a dark, dark place. Um, and last night I, I guess I've been doing this enough that I, I got in, I just lay down on the floor and I just said to the Lord in the middle of the night, I actually lay down in the middle of the floor where yesterday we had a prayer meeting and I just imagined all the prayers of those people surrounding me still. Wow. And I just said, Lord, I'm so tired of not being enough, but I'm going to go back to bed now <laughs> <laughs> because I trust that you are working here in ways I can't see. And I'm just like every single day I have to just keep saying, I literally said this aloud to my husband yesterday. I'm just going to keep being a little person who's like a pebble in the shoe of the darkness. And I'm going to feel like I'm just a little pebble. But Jesus says yeast in the dough, it's kneaded in and it's just an annoyance. Anybody who does not want that dough to rise is just out of luck because the, the yeast is there. It's so tiny. It can't be seen. It can't be removed. And it's, it's bringing something new to the world. And it's hard to be that small. But if we just keep saying yes, so on a daily basis, I'll say this and then I'll finish. On a daily basis, what that looks like then is just every day I walk. First thing in the morning, I want to get up and I want to get on my email and get stuff done. But I walk instead down to the river and I lower myself, <laughs> like I empty myself at the riverbank every morning and say, here's all the things I'm scared of. Here's all the things I'm anxious about. I'm just making, I'm just giving them to you, Lord. And what are you? What are you calling me to do today? I'll just do that. You know, I have things on my calendar, but many of them are things that, yeah, I don't even know if they're all gonna if they're all gonna work, you know. And so I just I just say I'll do the next good thing. I have it in my capacity to do that thing, and I'll do that. And it's bring it's it's bringing you new life. It's bringing renewal. It's miracles are happening here slowly but surely. Miracles are happening in me too. I'm growing in my capacity even as I keep doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm actually, I know I'd said, I'd say one more thing and finish, but I will just say this one thing and then I will finish in the miracle of that. I am learning to be fearless. Hmm. Well, I mean, I'm fearful, but <laughs> I'm learning, mm -hmm. I'm learning a capacity in myself that has to be the spirit of God in me because I know that I don't, I don't do these things. God is doing them. Um, so somehow I'm, I'm finding my true self in, in stepping into the things that I actually don't feel capacity to do. 
um I love the story of Jeremiah where um Jeremiah 1 God says I'm calling you to be a prophet to the nations and Jeremiah says "Mm -mm, I'm just a child (laughs) and God doesn't say oh no you're great you're fine you've got all kinds of skills and gifts he says I am calling you I am sending you I will equip you and I will give you the words to say and so that's all we're able to do and God is good yeah wow I Mandy I'm I'm so grateful for you I I your willingness to be honest and share what God is doing in your life is so in I know it has been so incredibly helpful for me personally. I know I can't speak for other people, but um, it has been really, really meaningful to hear what God is doing in you as you share honestly. And um, I'm just really, really grateful mm. for for the Thank way you. God has worked in your life. And I feel like God has worked in my life because of the way that God has worked in your life. And well, that blesses me because it scares me to talk about this stuff. Like I'd I'd still really like to feel like I'm on top of things, like yeah. anybody. But I feel called to share because somebody I wanted I need somebody to say this to me. And so I'm like, well God, I've really wrestled with him about sharing these things. But I'm a little bit I'm terrified and I'm also a little bit addicted to the the peace and the freedom I see mm-hmm. in other people's faces when mm-hmm. they're like, oh you too. So I think, I guess we all then need to pass it on, you know, and give grace to one Mm. another to say, you're not alone. Yeah. We're all small and we're all places where God's glory can be shown. Yeah. Because of the glory, because of how small we are, like when David kills a giant, everyone's like, something's not right there because that (laughs) does not happen. Right. You know, there's, there's there's a gap there between what David just did and what David should be able to do. And we're going to call that God. And that's yeah. in every miracle of the Bible between, you know, the loaves and the fishes and the feeding of the multitudes. Then you can say, wow. Yeah. And the miracle of how God uses us is not, is not really able to be marveled at if we're taking all the credit and trying to be strong. Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. <laughs> Mandy, thank you again so much yeah. for setting aside the time to, to be with us, to record this. And uh, so if so, if you haven't already been familiar with Mandy, you now understand why I talk about how much I appreciate her all the time. Mandy uh, does have a new book coming out next year uh, called Confessions of a Secular Saint. I can't wait to read that. Um, and if you want to encounter more of her work, you can check out Mandy's website at thewayistheway.org. Mandy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, so grateful for you. Bless you. I just pray blessings over you and over your church. And um, I just tell the darkness it has no right in anything that is happening in that community. Mm. You are children of the light in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you.